seven conventional habits that are keeping your dog, your cat sick. Number one, and I know you've heard me say this before, it's the food you're feeding your dog or cat. Commercial processed dog and cat food, it is not going to give your dog, your cat, all the nutrients they need to thrive. Let's just use the analogy of us going into a grocery store. If you just stick to those center aisles, you're just getting the stuff that has this extended long shelf life, i.e. this canned vegetable barley soup. If this is all you ever eat, you are gonna get sick. Our dogs are cats, they are no different. If you wanna stay healthy, eat less of this, more of this. If you want your dog and your cat to be healthier, you wanna be feeding them less of the kibble. You wanna be feeding them more real food, AKA, we had ribs last night. There's some leftover animal protein. Guess what? That's what Tula had for supper last night. Real food. I understand that many of you are on a budget. Like you just can't go out and afford to make all your dog's food at home or just feed them only raw. But what you can be doing is one, if you're going to be feeding kibble, try to feed as good a quality kibble as you can. Rotate that kibble every sort of three to four months along with supplementing it or adding in an egg. I mean, it's rich in vitamins A, D, E, a great source of protein, great source of calcium and potassium. Ground flax, it's super inexpensive. It's a great source of fiber. It's a great source of the omega-3 fatty acids. It also has things called ligands, which have been shown to be preventive against some of the types of cancers. Cats in particular, they're obligate carnivores. Get your cat off that high carb loaded kibble. Get your cat on a species appropriate food. Number two, genetics and breeding. I love it that there's so many different types of dogs, so many dog breeds. Unfortunately, what's happened with so many of the dog breeds, dogs have been bred to look a certain way and they're not actually looking at specific health characteristics. Look at animals such as bulldogs. I mean, if we as veterinarians weren't performing cesarean sections, there wouldn't be many bulldogs these days. There is a big demand for certain breeds, you know, such as the French bulldog. You're gonna have your ethical breeders and you're gonna have your less than ethical breeders. I personally think that it's time for many of these breed associations to make some big changes and put health like number one on the list. So what can you do different? Do your own research, see what specific genetic diseases have been linked to that breed and ensure you know, that your dog has a very limited chance of ever getting that disease because you're dealing with a responsible breeder. Number three, I feel I've been talking about these a lot lately, vaccines. Yes, vaccines are important to prevent serious infectious disease. I don't advocate for no vaccines, but what I do advocate for is a minimal number of vaccines, a far decreased vaccine regimen for cats. And if your cat is strictly indoors, your cat needs no vaccines, in my opinion. Vaccines work by stimulating the immune system. The immune system get overstimulated. It can respond inappropriately i.e. to our millions of dogs that have allergies. Vaccinate your dog, vaccinate your cat less often. Number four, the insecticides we're giving our dogs and cats on a regular basis. Would you personally stay on insecticides for your entire life and not expect to be sick? But some of that insecticide, your dog, your cat, they're then gonna have to metabolize. And if you're giving that to them over the lifetime of your dog, your cat, you're asking their organs to do more work. No, we're not really 100% clear as what are the potential long-term side effects. Makes sense to me, and it probably makes sense to you, that if you're going to give that to your dog or cat long-term, you're going to increase the likelihood of them getting sick. You can invest in this 50-cent flea comb, right? Date once a day, like you comb your dog thoroughly, check for ticks, you find a tick, you remove it. There are many holistic options. No, they're not going to work as quick. No, they're not necessarily going to be as effective. But if you're willing to put in the time, you don't need to be using these on an ongoing lifelong basis. And you can just use them when they're needed. Number five is wanting that boom, magic fix. Your dog got allergies, he's chronic itching and scratching. I understand the need and the desire to, to stop that as soon as you can. Products like steroids, the Abiquil, they're great. They work really quick. But the issue is these drugs, pretty long-term, they can have some pretty serious side effects. Apoquil, it's listed as an immunosuppressant. In some cases with animals that are about to develop cancer, that can be the trigger. In my opinion, you're better off going a little bit slower. You're not looking for that instant fix, but you're trying some of the alternative remedies. So to this is this quercetin, this great natural antihistamine, got some great anti-inflammatory properties. 
So point number five, just go a little bit slower, don't look for that instant fix, and really seriously consider the holistic options. At number six, may be seen as being a little bit controversial, too many diagnostic tests. Clearly, if your dog or your cat, they're seriously ill, it's really important to know what's going on with them. And then's the clear indicator why you should be doing a diagnostic test. But I have some really big concerns, as do many others, about these so-called preventive diagnostics. The problem with that strategy is then you're gonna start to see something on an x-ray or something on an ultrasound or some abnormal blood test. And you're like, we gotta further investigate this. Turns out in many cases, that's just a wild goose chase. You can start with the old axiom that they also taught us in veterinary school. Common things, they occur commonly. So when your dog comes in limping, and yeah, maybe his lymph node is slightly enlarged on his right rear leg, it's most likely he's still done something like strain his ACL ligament versus having some weird autoimmune polyarthritis. And his lymph node's probably enlarged because he's got a bit of a skin infection. In summary, less diagnostic tests. Number seven, this is kind of a big one which I think is really important for every pet parent. Like you need to be questioning your veterinarian more often. So number one, expect to get a full physical exam, not just a like, eh, okay, she looks okay. And number two, expect to get asked a full history. Like when did this first start? What have you noticed? Et cetera, et cetera. Based on all that, you know, then ask like, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Then based on the most likely diagnosis, what is the first or most important diagnostic test we should be doing first, if we even need to do one? This is your dog, it's your cat. Ultimately, it is up to you to consent to whatever they're gonna do. But ultimately, it is your choice, not their choice. So you become your pet's advocate and learn about these natural remedies. So for instance, if your dog has a recurring ear infection, you see this black waxy debris, you likely may have yeast. You've watched a bunch of the videos. You know that something like over-the-counter canison, that's a legitimate option. Point number seven, ask a ton of questions, be engaged, like be the empowered pet parent. Thanks so much for watching this edition of Veterinary Secrets of the Seven Conventional Habits that may be keeping your pet sick. Click up there to subscribe, hit the bell to sign up for notifications, and when you click that link directly in the box below, I can send you a copy of my free book.